Thank you very much for that gracious introduction. It's a pleasure to be back here as a faculty member rather than a student. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, fighting the remnants of a cold, so um, if I suddenly sound croaky, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> my uh, subject this afternoon is a piece of the book, um, the piece of the book about God that I'm currently working on with my friend and fellow Yale graduate student and longtime theological conversation partner, Carol P. Christ. Um, we have been arguing about God for many years, uh, mainly via email since Carol is living in Greece, and we decided that it's time to engage each other in writing and reflect on the different ways in which feminism has impacted our understanding of God, and that's, that's a central theme uh, of the book. Um, when we were trying to figure out how to get into the project, we decided to start by writing our spiritual autobiographies from childhood through leaving Yale. And we weren't clear initially whether we were doing this just to clarify our own positions or whether uh, this writing would actually be part of the book. Once I started writing, uh, I, I really enjoyed it, and I realized that maybe I could communicate my theology more clearly through narrative than through more formal theological writing. And I felt impelled to keep going, and so Carol and I have each written another chapter bringing our uh, journeys up to the present. So what I want to do today is to pull out one strand from among several um, in these chapters and focus on uh, the problem of evil, which is in fact the issue that brought me into theology. I've tried to um, stitch up the gaps that result from picking up pieces of the narrative. Um, if there appear to be gaps, though, they're probably are, and I apologize. With the exception of the ultra-Orthodox, most American Jews find it very difficult to talk about God. Although God is the foundation and the presupposition of all of Jewish history and practice, most Jews tend to assume, ignore, or consign the existence of God to deep background rather than discuss or reflect upon it. The topic is intimate and a bit embarrassing, even more so than sex or money, not something to be aired in polite company. To talk about God, to acknowledge that one believes in God, is to reveal something faintly suspicious and more than a little awkward about oneself. I have frequently heard Christian friends use the language of being called to the ministry or priesthood. The rabbinate, on the other hand, is regarded by Jews as a profession. It would be a rare rabbi who would speak of being called to the role by God, even if that was his or her internal experience. I begin my mentioning this difficulty because it explains my experience of feeling different and peculiar from the time that I was quite small. I'm certain that I was born a theologian. Did God call me to be one? That formulation does not fit with my concept of God, but my early interest in theological questions set me apart from my family and most of the other Jews in my community. I have a very sharp memory from when I was seven of being at the children's service at our reformed temple on the morning of Yom Kippur and being deeply moved by both the words and music of a particular hymn. Although my parents did not expect me to return to temple for the afternoon service, my attendance at the children's service was enough to justify my staying out of school. I promised God that I would come back. 
When I got home, my cross the street neighbor invited me to play with her, and I said I couldn't because I had to go back to Temple. She pressed me, and I said that I'd promised. Promised who, she asked. I told her that I'd promised God. But I can still feel my awkwardness and sense of embarrassment in doing so. I couldn't have explained the feeling, but I know I had the distinct impression that it was weird to make a promise to God and equally weird to talk about it. My memories of my pre-adolescent musings about God are few, but one moment stands out for me during this period. I must have been about nine years old when one night as I was lying in bed, it suddenly occurred to me that God might be a woman. I remember thinking, we don't know what God is. There's no reason that God couldn't be a woman. I felt overcome by a kind of giddy exuberance as I hugged the thought to myself. I lay awake for 15 or 20 minutes just turning the revelation over in my mind. I don't recall playing with the thought any time but that night. It was only when I began to think about female God language as a graduate student that the incident came back to me. I suspect the idea was too incompatible with all that I had absorbed from my surroundings for me to have been able to hang on to it for more than a moment. In my junior high and high school years, I began to think about God and other theological questions in a more sustained and focused way. When I was 12, one of my closest friends and I began reading and talking about the Holocaust. We devoured the diary of Anne Frank, spending hours discussing it, and also read a number of other books that we seemed to have picked up haphazardly. Although I can't remember any titles other than the diary, I know that this reading inducted me into the mystery of human evil. The issue of God's involvement in the Holocaust troubled me, but my more urgent questions were how human beings could be capable of such evil and whether Jews could have been Nazis. I pondered whether there was something in the German character that led to the Holocaust or whether it was simply historical accident that Jews had been the victims and not the perpetrators. I felt a deep sense of relief that I did not need to know the answer to that question. It was a moral privilege to be a victim, I thought, a conviction that was very central to my Jewish identity for many years. My sense of relief was not wedded to a sense of moral superiority, however, because I did not know whether Jews would have refrained from acting similarly if given the opportunity. This uncertainty was possibly the first expression of the theme of ambiguity that's been so central to my work. <clears throat> it was never for me a simple matter of us and them, the good guys and the bad guys, Rather, reading about the Holocaust made me aware of what human beings are capable of. <coughs> In college, I discovered the works of Elie Wiesel. Reading Night, and then over time, his early novels, The Accident, Dawn, Town Beyond the Wall, and Gates of the Forest, brought together the themes of God's existence and the riddle of evil that I had spent much time contemplating in high school. Wiesel's anger at a God from whom he was unable to disconnect himself shaped my understanding of God for many years. I loved the integrity and the deep irony of Wiesel's story in the gates of the forest of three rabbis in Auschwitz who put God on trial for the Holocaust and find him guilty, only to be chosen for extermination the next day. I can no longer reconstruct exactly when I read each book or when certain constellations of ideas began to come together for me, but the notion of holding God accountable for Jewish su suffering uh, resonated deeply with a theme I loved in Jewish tradition. The idea that the covenant entails mutual obligations 
and that just as God can hold the Jewish people responsible for their sins, so God is also bound by God's covenantal promises. In the mid-1970s, I gave a talk on the Torah portion for the second day of Rosh Hashanah, the story of the binding of Isaac, in which I argued that God's command to Abraham to sacrifice his son illustrated the amoral sovereignty of God. This was an important Jewish theme, I said, from Isaiah's, I form light and create darkness, I make wheel and create woe to Wiesel's sad, angry, and ironic tales. Though this was some time after college, it expressed an understanding of God that had been percolating in me for a long time since my first encounter with Wiesel. My favorite line from Albert Camus' The Plague, another novel that spoke to me deeply during my college years, also captured this understanding explaining his response to the plague to a <clears throat> comrade in struggle. The protagonist, Dr. Rieu, says, since the order of the world is shaped by death, mightn't it be better for God if we refuse to believe in him and struggle with all our might against death without lifting our eyes to heaven where he sits in silence? I spent my junior year of college at the University of Edinburgh and in a biblical studies class had the opportunity to study the book of Job in some depth. I previously encountered Job in high school when we were reading the Bridge of San Luis Rey and my English teacher asked me to look at Job and talk about its relationship to Wilder. I remember distinctly coming into class completely puzzled about what God's answer to Job had to do with the rest of the book and expecting that the teacher would explain what I had obviously missed. When I studied Job in Edinburgh, however, I realized that my earlier confusion actually embodied an important insight. God's speeches don't have anything to do with the question that Job was asking. Job, like Elie Wiesel, was a man profoundly connected to God through his overpowering anger. Job undergoes a moral education in the course of the book, moving from raging about his own personal undeserved suffering to recognizing larger patterns of injustice in the world and the absence of any link between people's behavior and reward and punishment. God overwhelms Job with God's might in answering him out of the whirlwind, but completely ignores the issue of justice that Job so eloquently raises. I saw God as a great bully, saying in effect, it's my game, if you don't like it, take your marbles and go home. My immersion in the book of Job fed my fascination with the problem of evil, as well as my understanding of God as responsible for evil along with good. <clears throat> as a graduate student at Yale, I wrote three of my four required doctoral comprehensives on the problem of evil. I did my historical theology exam on the doctrine of original sin, my philosophical exam on the problem of evil and analytic philosophy, and my special exam on Holocaust theology. I no longer have a copy of my philosophical theology paper, but I remember ending it by allying myself with Ivan Karamazov's desire to give back his ticket in protest against a world in which innocent children have to suffer. Wiesel's anger at a god who cannot be disconnected from the Holocaust, and Rieu's refusal to believe in a God who remained silent in the face of the plague continued to speak to me very deeply. I finished my graduate education still believing in a God with whom it was appropriate to be angry. As the classical formulation of the problem of evil put it, either God could not prevent evil or God would not and the would not was much less compelling to me than the idea, I'm sorry, and the would not was much more compelling to me than the idea of God's powerlessness. <clears throat> it 
was several years before I consciously relinquished this understanding of God. But my feminism, in a quiet way, was already beginning to undermine it. I became a feminist in the fall of 1969, the year, the year that Yale admitted women to the undergraduate college and increased the entering class to 1,250 students so that it could still graduate 1,000 male leaders. The university prepared for the education of women by putting full-length mirrors in the bathrooms and adding a gynecologist to the health center staff. <laughs> Three female graduate students in the social sciences called a meeting to discuss how it was that we had been at Yale for 80 years and no one had noticed. The energy of our gathering was high and we decided to keep meeting and to call ourselves the Yale Women's Alliance. Engaging in both consciousness raising and activism, we explored from many angles the contradictions we experienced between our hopes and plans for our lives and the expectations of us as women. We talked about our relationships with our mothers and fathers, our lovers, husbands, and children. We shared what it was like to be girls headed for graduate school at a time when that was an unusual choice for a woman. One of my most powerful moments in the group came when I realized that we had all been told that we were too smart for girls and advised to dumb ourselves down if we wanted to catch a man. So many of the issues that I and the others had thought were our own personal problems, we could now see were products of our socialization as women. We were living the personal as the political before it became a slogan in that we repeatedly made connections between issues in our own lives and broader social structures. It was an incredibly heady, exciting, and difficult journey as we heard each other into speech, to use Mel, Mel Morton's phrase, not avoiding the painful places in our lives. I remember one evening when a woman with children kept asking, but if I am not a mother, who am I? She was facing what Mary Daly was to describe as the experience of nothingness that comes with stripping away patriarchal definitions of self. Through the Yale Women's Alliance and other feminist groups, I experienced a new kind of agency a participation in larger social and even cosmic projects, a conviction that women working together could remake the world. In the summer of 1972, I had the privilege of attending the Women Exploring Theology Conference at Grailville, an amazing event at which 60 women came together not just to express our pain and anger at our marginalization within our various communities, but also to initiate new modes of speaking and acting as religiously committed women. It was a life-changing experience for me, a week during which I made formative friendships and witnessed the power of women working <coughs> together to transform our respective traditions. The center of the conference consisted of morning groups organized around particular themes that met throughout our time together. And I was part of a group of four that decided to focus on consciousness raising as a religious experience. We, ex we spent an extraordinary week both immersing ourselves in and analyzing our prior experiences of consciousness raising and recreating those experiences through the power of our conversations. At the end of the week, I suggested that we use the rabbinic story of Lilith as a vehicle for communicating both our process and our insights into the religious dimensions of consciousness raising. I went back to my room to try to compose a story, and the coming of Lilith came pouring through me. When all the groups reported out the last evening, there was a sense of tremendous excitement and jubilation as group after group offered new paradigms and images for thinking about God, self, sexuality, singleness and community, politics and tradition. 
My Lilith story ended with Eve and Lilith returning to the garden together, eager not only to transform their world, but sensing that their connection would mean changes in the very nature of God. Independently, the group on singleness and community had decided that traditional names for God were no longer ad adequate, and they had made a list of words that meant God to them. Changing, creating, extending me beyond myself, enabling, connecting, challenging, loving, nurturing, confronting, and numerous others. Their non-objectifying process words expressed through many ING endings captured the energy of my Lilith story and of the conference as a whole, and conveyed a sense of what Mary Daly would call God the Verb in her Beyond God the Father, published a year later. Initially unperceived by me, the edifice of my prior beliefs was giving way, not with a mighty crash, but quietly, hardly noticeably, before the power of an alternative understanding. It would be false to suggest, however, that all my experiences of feminism were positive and energizing. They also had their problematic side. As the only Jew in numerous feminist religious contexts, I frequently encountered both Christian ignorance of Judaism and an unexamined Christian triumphalism. When Leonard Swidler's Jesus Was a Feminist was published in Catholic World in 1971, and then picked up and reiterated by numerous Christian feminists, I was disturbed to realize that the case for Jesus' feminism depended on depicting first century Judaism in unrelievedly negative terms, often using much later Talmudic texts as evidence for the first century. To me, the effort to lay Christian sexism at the feet of Judaism was not simply a sign of ignorance or academic sloppiness, but a profound failure of the feminist ethic. In Mary Daly's words, a failure to lay claim to that part of the psyche that is then projected onto the other. Feminist consciousness, I discovered, was no protection against reproducing patterns of exclusion and domination. In 1978, I published Christian Feminism and Anti-Judaism, in which I argued that Christian feminists had just given a new twist to old anti-Jewish arguments. But shortly after the article appeared, it was brought home to me that my critique of Christian feminism applied equally to me. In the summer of 1979, Alice Walker published a piece in Ms. Magazine in which she took white feminists to task for their ignorance of black women's literature and inability to imagine themselves into black women's experience. I recognized myself in every word she wrote. The lesson of my childhood musings on the Holocaust reemerged with renewed urgency and became an ongoing theme in my speaking and writing. There is no us and them, no group that is only oppressed or only oppressor. In April 1979, during a period when I was deeply immersed in teaching and writing about feminism and theology, my mother died of a malignant brain tumor that 10 months earlier had robbed her of her intellect and personality and left her in a persistent vegetative state for six months. Her funeral was a turning point for me, a crucial moment of recognition that I had truly left behind my earlier understanding of God. My mother was 58 when she died her cruel and lingering death. Her illness and loss could easily have provided me with a splendid new opportunity to be angry at the God who had evaded Job's questions about justice and remained silent during the Holocaust. But quite to my surprise, I found I was angry not at God, but at the colossal irrelevance of the reform funeral service. I simply did not want to hear about God, the Lord, and King, mercy, and justice. 
I wanted to be told that people are born and die, that God gives and takes away, that the moon waxes and wanes, that tides move in and out, that nothing really dies, that everything is taken up in our memories and in the ecology of the planet. My mind floated to Nell Morton's article, The Goddess as Metaphoric Image, in which she discusses her fear of flying and her irritating habit of pleading with the powerful male deity in the sky whenever a plane hit turbulence. <clears throat> she describes an occasion on which she told herself to stop behaving like a child and see what would happen if she invoked the goddess. Morton discovered that the goddess was not mistress of the skies and wind, but was in the clouds and air currents. And she then relaxed her tightened limbs and even enjoyed the rhythm of the plane's movements. This was the god or goddess I wanted to hear about at my mother's funeral, a god goddess who is the cycles of life and death, who gives birth to myriad life forms as the ocean gives rise to waves, and who sustains us in life and also in sorrow. The transcendent and omnipotent god of my girlhood and young adulthood, who had betrayed his promises to the Jewish people and who could have prevented a brain tumor if he so willed it, had simply vanished. I no longer look to a God enthroned above me in the sky, but God all around and in me, in the firm ground beneath my feet that allowed me to walk upright. Without my conscious awareness of the steps in the process, my feminist insights and commitments had brought me to an understanding of God that I could gladly embrace. Given this shift in my understanding of God, it was perhaps not surprising that I scarcely addressed the problem of evil in my full-length Jewish feminist theology standing again at Sinai. I did not plan to avoid the issue, and in fact, I was rather startled and a bit nonplussed when I finished the book and realized I had not dealt with it. There was a time when I would have picked up any Jewish theology that did not deal with the Holocaust and flung it across the room in disgust. But God's responsibility for evil had simply ceased to be a problem for me. I no longer thought of God as the omnipotent Lord of history with the power and responsibility to intervene in creation. God, the ground and wellspring of life, could act only through the world, not upon it from outside. The enterprise of theodicy, the effort to justify God's goodness and power given the existence of evil, had become much less interesting to me than the ways in which our language about God supports social, political, and religious inequalities of power. Yet while I understood my failure to deal with God's relationship to evil in the book, in the aftermath of finishing it, I came to be seriously troubled by the omission. Whether or not God should be blamed for the evils in the world, evil is still a reality that demands exploration. Just at the point that standing again at Sinai was going to press, the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion published a round table entitled, If God is God, She is Not Nice, initiated <laughs> by Katherine Madsen. Madsen complained that when feminists think of God as goddess or give her female characteristics, they tend to endow her with the so-called feminine virtues of nurturing, healing, and uh, caretaking, cordoning her off from the unpredictability of the world. Although none of the images I offer in Standing Again at Sinai can be described as traditionally feminine, the round table nonetheless made me recognize the extent to which I'd focused on an empowering God and neglected those aspects of reality that are disempowering and destructive. 
A year later, I published a short article facing the ambiguity of God in which I took myself to task for neglecting evil and drew a distinction between the classical problem of theodicy and the profoundly ambiguous nature of all creativity and creation. True, I no longer believed in a perfectly good and omnipotent God who acted in history and could therefore be blamed for remaining silent in the face of injustice. But I still knew the world, in Madsen's words, with its droughts and floods, its extremes of climate, its strange combination of tender bounty and indifference, and the uneasiness of human society with its descents into savagery. Where was the place for these aspects of reality in standing again at Sinai. And for that matter, where was the place for my awareness that feminism afforded no protection against perpetrating injustice? After I finished standing again at Sinai, I briefly revisited the problem of evil in several lectures on reconsidering evil, in which I sought to understand the lack of interest in theodicy in feminist theology generally. I saw the neglect of the topic as attributable to a widely shared feminist understanding of God as empowering, non-personal, and imminent in creation, a God who it made no sense to blame for the evils in the world. As women claim our power as agents in community and history, I argued, we come to know ourselves as grounded in a greater power that nourishes and sustains us, even as it sustains the universe of which we are a tiny part. But, I asked, mustn't we also acknowledge that as we become effective in the world in new ways, we gain new power to hurt and destroy others? Haven't we learned that our own oppression brings no guarantees that we won't in turn oppress others? Isn't the same cosmic ambiguity to which Madsen directs our attention, the droughts and floods, bounty and indifference of the world, manifest in human nature, in our capacity to use creativity for great good, for great evil, and for everything in between? The anger at God I had nursed for many years now transformed itself into the insistence that an inclusive monotheism must embrace the complexities and ambiguities of existence as part of the nature of God. A concept of God that provided a map of the universe that did not leave out its terrors was more satisfying to me, I realized than one that expressed and crystallized ideals. Two experiences I had in 1991 further contributed to my interest in rethinking God's relationship to the ambiguous forces at work in the universe and ourselves. In the summer of 1991, in conjunction with attending a feminist conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina, my partner and I visited Iguazu Falls and spent three days in the Amazon. <coughs> Iguazu is one of the largest series of waterfalls in the world, and it lies on the border of Brazil and Argentina. I expected to find the falls beautiful, we had been told they were not to be missed. But I did not expect to be utterly mesmerized by them, to feel as if I could stand and look at them forever, and to weep when we had to leave after three days. Particularly when we visited the Devil's Throat, a spot where it's possible to stand on a platform over the roiling waters at the bottom of the largest waterfall. I felt I was gazing at the wellspring of life in all its terror and sublimity. On the one hand, the energy, potency, and beauty of the water were incredibly energizing and empowering. It felt to me that if human beings could only tap into the electricity of the current and allow it to flow through us, we could indeed, in the words of Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. 
On the other hand, the waters knew no moral purpose. They could as easily overwhelm and destroy as nourish and vivify. They seemed to transcend the distinction between power with and power over that had been so central to feminist theology. They could lift up and sustain or engulf and annihilate. I had seen the face of God, and it brought home to me the complex and multifaceted nature of all creativity, human and divine. A week later, we spent three days at a hotel in the Amazon at the juncture of the Rio Negro and the Ariau River. We arrived in pitch blackness after a long boat ride up the Rio Negro to be directed to a room with only screens for the outer wall filled with the sounds of frogs and crickets. At five o'clock in the morning, we were startled by, the sound, by what sounded like the whole river being drained by a huge vacuum. A terrifying noise that we afterwards discovered was howler monkeys calling to each other. <laughs> we dressed hurriedly, went outside, and accompanied by monkeys, climbed a tall wooden tower to see the sunrise. I have a phobia of heights and normally would not think of ascending an open and rickety looking wooden structure. But in this case, my excitement overpowered my fear. The sun rose as it had set the previous evening, a giant red ball ascending into the sky with amazing rapidity. As it rose, the whole world came to life. The egrets we'd seen flying to their trees at sunset took off again as did flocks of flycatchers. The macaws that lived at the hotel began to squawk, and squirrel monkeys swung from tree to tree. It was a vast panoply of sights and sounds that made us feel if, as if we were present at the moment of creation. Our time in the Amazon was both magical and unnerving, rich and overwhelming. The density and tangledness of the vegetation, the strange sounds, the snakes, monkeys, and other animals that might appear at any moment and that were still wild, even when they lived at the hotel, the vultures feeding on the carcass of a crocodile, the hordes of ants, the piranhas lurking in the river. I experienced a deep sense of reverence for the astoundingly intricate and complex universe of which I was a part. This is not the lord of history at work here, I wrote in my journal of the trip, but the infinitely fertile and inventive <coughs> source of life. These experiences reinforced the understanding of God that had been growing in me since my mother's funeral. God is the creative energy that underlies, animates, and sustains all existence the ground of being, the source of all that is, the power of life, death, and regeneration in the universe. God's presence fills all of creation, and creation simultaneously dwells in God. In my concept of God, wholeness or inclusiveness carries more theological weight than goodness. The world as we know it has little use for human plans and aspirations. We can be stunned by the beauty of the raging waters of the sea and an instant later find ourselves and the things we love annihilated by them. We can be astounded by the care, altruism, and intricate interdependence found everywhere in nature and also by its predation and violence. When we look at ourselves, we find the same, often ambiguous mixture of motives and effects. Most people are capable of great kindness and also of cruelty. Human beings have imagined remarkable ways to care, to care for the most vulnerable among us and have also used our inventiveness to torture and kill. Moreover, there's not a straightforward relationship between our intentions and their outcomes. Things we mean for good frequently have unforeseen negative consequences, just as we can mean something for ill, and yet good can come of it. To deny God's presence in all this, to see God only in the good, 
seems to me to leave huge aspects of reality outside of God. Where do they come from? How are they able to continue in existence? How can we not see that the same amazing inventiveness that allows us to establish systems of justice, feed the hungry, and find cures for many diseases is present when we develop new weapons or build crematoria? It is on this issue of the ambiguity of God that I see most clearly the continuing thread that has marked my perspective from adolescence to the, presence, to the present. On the one hand, my understanding of God has changed dramatically. On the other hand, the words of Isaiah, I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Still resonate for me as a profound metaphor for the ambiguity of the creative energy that pulses through the whole complex web of creation and sustains us in life. I would maintain, though it may not seem so, that this notion of God provides significant grounding for ethical reflection and action. While the creative energy flowing through the world may have no moral purpose, the notion of oneness embodies a profound moral trajectory. To say that God is one, that the divine presence that animates the universe is one, is to say that we are all bound to each other in the continual unfolding of the adventure of creation. In the human family, for all our differences, we are more alike than we are unlike. All of us are faces of the God who dwells within each of us. The same standards of justice should apply to everyone. When we harm, diminish, or oppress any one of us, we harm ourselves. And this is true not simply of human beings, but of the whole web of creation. We are linked to each other in a remarkably complex, intricate web of life the individual elements of which are thoroughly interconnected. As creatures who have self-consciousness, who in our better moments are able to glimpse and appreciate our place in the larger whole, we have a deep ethical obligation to act in the interests of that whole and the individuals and biotic communities within it. We are just one species on a small planet revolving around the sun in one solar system. Yet we have developed a unique capacity to overwhelm and poison the ecological system of which we are part. In the words of Deuteronomy, we are poised between life and death, blessing and curse. Our ability to choose life requires us to act on behalf of the flourishing of life to participate in the unfolding of divine creativity as it manifests itself in the myriad forms of creation. As I was working on this narrative, I asked myself whether I can still find meaning in my once loved book of Job, given how thoroughly my concept of God has changed. Are there parts of the book that continue to resonate for me as for the girl I once was? And what might I read differently? I find that I'm no less moved than was my young self by Job's anger at the injustices of the world and by his gradually dawning of incomplete realization that others beside him suffer without reason. Job's vivid descriptions of the disconnection between human behavior and its just rewards appear to me no less breathtakingly brave or devastatingly accurate than when I first read them. But when I turn to God's reply to Job, I find myself less angered by its evasiveness than struck by its extraordinary beauty and power. <clears throat> Here, in a more sustained way than anywhere else in the Bible, we find a description of the intrinsic value of the natural world apart from human purposes, a peon to the wonders of a strange and mysterious creation that pre-exists human beings and that has its own order and meaning. 
the natural world of God's reply to Job, like the waters of Iguazu, is unrestrained, turbulent, powerful, joyous, and beautiful. While I had always been aware of this dimension of Job, I had dismissed it as irrelevant to the book Central Problematic. I was never able to hold together my indignation at God's refusal to answer Job's question about justice and my love for the language of the morning stars singing together, the horse pawing in the valley and exulting in his strength, and the behemoth made as God made us, eating grass like an ox. But now it occurred to me that much as Job may not want to hear it, this is God's answer to his question. Right, the author of the speeches imagines God as saying to Job, the order of the universe is not founded on justice. It's not about you or your human standards. The world is about other things entirely creativity, beauty, diversity, power, energy. It's about the amazing panorama of creation, the springs of the sea and the dwelling of light, the storehouses of snow and hail, the ostrich leaving her eggs on the ground to be trampled, and the eagle making its home in the fastness of the craggy rock. Let me be clear that this is a different reading from saying, as many have argued, that God's perspective is broader than ours, and that if only we could see the world from God's point of view, we would understand the fairness of Job's suffering. The truth is that God's speeches show no concern for fairness, and in any event, there's no such thing as justice that leaves its comprehensible meanings behind. But God doesn't stop there. The speeches are followed by the puzzling epilogue in which Job turns to the friends who throughout the book have berated him and told him he must have done something to deserve his misery. God says to them, you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. What can this mean when God has seemingly been rebuking Job for the previous four chapters? It strikes me now that the apparent contradiction between the thrust of God's speeches and this surprising conclusion may hold the key to the book. God, the wellspring of life and creative energy that dwells within all that exists, is unconcerned with justice. Indeed, the very word concern unduly personalizes the ground of being that sustains and enlivens all that is good, bad, and indifferent. But is our job to be concerned with justice? Job has spoken well of God for two reasons. First, unlike his friends, he tells the truth. Lambasted by his supposed comforters, hemmed in on all sides, he still refuses to say what he knows to be false, that the good are rewarded and the wicked punished. Second, Job refuses to relinquish the yearning for justice that he fails to see in the world. Finding set before him life and death, first blessing and then curse, he chooses life in the form of speaking truth and demanding justice. <clears throat> this This is our task as human beings in the face of an all-embracing God, to affirm the ties that bind us to each other and creation, and to be the justice required for creation to flourish. Thank you.